Uh, hi, I'm Emily Sowood. I'm a software engineer at the Satellite Applications Catapult, uh, based down in Harwell. Uh, during the course of, well, my work, I have had unfortunate numbers of times having to dig into the insides of TIFF files. Um, I've had to write several different reading programs, several different writers, various languages. Um, I'm sure you all know of TIFF files. I'm sure you've used them many, many times. Um, with any luck, none of you have ever had to dig inside them. I really hope you haven't because they're horrible. Um, so what I'm talking about today is basically what is a TIFF file, what's inside them, how do they work, and a bit about why we use them and how we can find out more about them. Ha! Good, it's working. The TIFF file. So it was created in 1986. Um, it's slightly younger than I am by the Aldous Corporation. It's now owned by Adobe. Um, there are a large number of reasons why we use them. Oops, what's going on there? Okay, weird, don't know what happened there. Um, there are, yeah, the main reason we use them is they have very wide adoption. They're kind of, almost everything can read a TIFF file if you want it to. Um, there's all sorts of things of reasons for using them over normal image formats. They're lossless, um, or they can use lossless compression, so you don't have weird things like JPEG artifacts and that kind of stuff. If you're doing the scientific stuff, that's important. And they also can handle multiple bands, which is one of the things that doesn't a lot of image formats don't deal with. So if you've got something which has got infrared or that kind of thing, a PNG or a GIF goes, I want a red, green, and blue. and maybe an alpha channel if you're lucky. Um, TIFF files can deal with all of that and quite comfortably. So once you get into a TIFF file, it's basically a blob of data. There are a few bits that are, uh, well, there's only one bit of it that's fixed. That's the header. Everything else can be anywhere it likes in the file. There is no standard for it. It can just go where it likes. It doesn't particularly care. Um, the first bit has to be the header and literally that has to be the start of the file and has to know part of that tells you where where the rest of the data is and then everything kind of works from that. Um, using a thing called using a thing of pointers. Uh, if you're not a computer science person pointers are a basically a number which says 2723 bytes into this file there is something important. Go over there and find it. Um, thankfully in TIFF files, everything is pointed to from the start of the file. So the first byte of the file zero is always the start of things. Um, otherwise, yeah, they point to an image file directory, which says, here's some information about a particular image. Part of TIFFs and their history uh, is they were originally built for or originally created to deal with a very large number of scanners that were appearing on the market at the time. And every scanner company was coming up with its own image file format. So the Eldest Corporation went, let's try and standardize this and created the TIFF file, um, which is partly why you have multiple images in a file is because if originally each page you scanned was a different image and then you had each page basically. Um, right, so then yeah, image file information directories point to some metadata which then points out the actual data itself. I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time talking about the actual data themselves in this because, well, an image is an image and the bit that makes the data interesting and how to deal with it is all in the image file directory and the metadata. So we don't really need to, once you've dealt with the metadata and things, reading the, reading the actual data out itself is not as bad as you'd think. Uh, so first up we have the header. The only fixed part, as I said, it has to be at the start of the file because otherwise there'd be no way of you ever finding the dang thing. Um, it starts off with a byte order marker, a magic number which says, I'm a TIFF file. And then the first 
image file directory is over there. Um, byte order markers, oops, come back, are um, a little computer science history at this point. Um, most things don't worry about them anymore. It basically tells you which way round you write numbers for historic reasons, which are way beyond the scope of this talk. Um, sometimes it's better to write numbers down, or write the number 100 as 001 rather than 100 when dealing with computer network stuff. Um, historically, there's been two ways of doing it. Um, nowadays, almost everybody just goes 100 because that's the way everyone expects them to be. But, you know, it's still an option. And in the 80s, it was still being contested which way round things were going to work. Um, also worth noting that big TIFFs um, exist. Anything that is a TIFF file over, in theory, 4 gig, but practically 2 gig bytes of size um, will probably want to be a big TIFF. It is the only main difference between a big TIFF and a normal TIFF is that all the pointers are twice as large. Um, so everywhere in this talk, I will talk about something being a pointer and it will be four bytes long. Um, in a big TIFF, they'd be eight bytes long, but basically that's the main difference. Um, yeah, so this hit, uh, can I, can you see my mouse if I put it over here? Um, is basically an example of a header. It's in little Indian formats. So, ooh, come back. Ah, crud. It's in little Indian format, so you get eight being the first one. So byte eight is the next byte along here. Um, otherwise, fairly straightforward, fairly simple. And then we get to the image file directories. Um, basically, it's a load of information about an image. It's not the actual image itself is just, you know, the image is 5,000 pixels wide. It's 5,000 pixels high. Um, it's compressed with gzip compression. It's got six bands, um, that kind of thing. There always has to be one IFD in a file. Um, you can't have a TIFF file without one because it wouldn't actually contain any data. Um, multiple IFDs are used for multiple page documents originally. Um, they get used for, in the geospatial world, quite a lot to do saw pyramids. So if you have a image at different resolutions to allow it to be rendered quicker, um, the different resolution layers will be stacked up as different pages in the TIFF file. Uh, each IFD basically contains a number of entries. The first thing in it, in it is a number which says there are 12 entries in this IFD. Um, there'll be a bunch of records and then a thing which points to the next one, if there is one, or it's just zero. So each record has is a fact about the image. They use a number to be the field type and each number maps to a particular property. Um, so you have a number which means the image width, a number which means the image height, a number which means uh, all kinds of things. There's an enormously long list of these things and it's also possible to have custom ones. Occasionally you will need to create your own custom ones, but 99.9% .9 of the time there is a existing one you can reuse. Um, It has a data type, which is a sort of, is it an int, a float, a piece of text, uh, so on, that kind of thing. Um, a number of entries, which is, some, some of the things are lists. So if you've got a, um, a string, for instance, it'll say, oh, the string is n long. Um, and then the last bit is either a pointer or the actual data itself if the data will is smaller than four bytes 
because there's no point having a pointer that points to somewhere else and then that's less than four bytes. Just waste time. Uh, an example there, which just basically says this is an image width um, and it's a short value and it's 5,000 pixels wide. Um, each of the fields in IFD tells you something about how the image should be decoded, rendered, or was taken. Um, in cameras and that kind of thing, this is where the EXIF data comes in. Um, it gets really complicated really quickly. This, the Library of Congress has a list of all the fields that are commonly used. Um, go look them up. Don't try and find them or figure them out yourself because they're just a big long list of numbers. Um, to give you an idea of how complicated this gets very quickly, uh, there are 12 different data types that I've discovered, eight different ways of compressing images that are standard. Um, there are more than this, but there are kind of extensions. Um, and yes, uncompressed is in there twice. I have no idea why it's a historical anomaly and one of them is listed as being deprecated now, thankfully. Um, but yeah, over the history of this thing, it had two uncompressed options. Uh, the photometric interpretation is basically how you view an image. So if, for instance, if you've only got one band, is zero black or is zero white? Um, is it red, green, and blue with a palette? So that basically means each entry is a number which says, I want number 16. It's like a um, one of those paint by numbers things um, or various other ways of things, ways of coloring an image. Not commonly used. Most of the time it's going to be one of the top three um, in geospatial stuff. Very occasionally for classification type images, you'll get a palette most of the time it's the top three. Um, and then the planar configuration is how the image is um, laid out in, mem in, in the file, in the data itself. I have never actually seen one that's listed as unknown. It's listed in the standard as being possible, but I'm not entirely sure how you'd ever decode something that was listed as unknown. Um, chunky and planar are the main ones and Basically, it means, is it red, green, blue next to each other? Or is it all the reds, all the greens, all the blues? Um, and yeah, when you multiply all these together to get them a possible number of things, you end up with 2,595 different combinations of just these four parameters. Um, so things can get complicated pretty quickly. So I built a tool called TIFFAX because yeah, I shouldn't be allowed to name things. Um, this is basically a tool to take a TIFF file and look at it in a hex editor and give you some information about it. I have had to do digging into these with hex editors too many times to try and figure out why is my image entirely purple? It's supposed to be a map of Oxford. What's going on? Um, and that kind of thing. So I built this to help me out. It's a tool, it's open source. Um, I am now going to attempt to do a very quick demo of it, if my computer will behave itself. Hurrah! Right. So, little tool, you run it, you point it at a TIFF file, it pops up a web browser with your file for it. Um, and it gives you a load of information about it and decodes it. So as you can see here, it says, this is a header. It's a TIFF file. It's a little endian. And the first one starts at eight. Um, and then, yeah, basically decodes all the values, tells you what they all mean. Um, helpfully for things that are pointers to stuff, it says, oh yes, the value shows that it's at 2,218, um, which is an offset. If you click on it, it jumps down to the, that chunk. Some of these are quite long because this is a 5,000 row file, um, but things like Oh yes, we have a geo, geo ASCII parameters file tag, which is, oh yes, this is in British National Grid format. Yay. Um, Five minutes. Cool. Uh, yeah, so 
as you may very briefly saw, you just run it and it will pop this up for you. Quite nice and simple. Okay. So whilst I've been doing this, I found an awful lot of silly things you can do with TIFF files. Um, I have never managed to break anything by doing any of these. Uh, the IFD loop is theoretically possible, in theory an infinitely long page of files, or number of pages in any file. Um, there's nothing stopping the last one pointing back to the first one. Again, I've not actually seen anything break when I've done this. It's surprisingly tolerant, but yeah, it's possible. Um, if you take all of the offsets, oops, come back here, take all the offsets and point them to the same row, um, you can end up with an image taking basically no space at all, and then storing a whole load of extra stuff at the end of it, which is kind of fun. And you can store all kinds of extra metadata as strings in it. Um, I have, for reasons which I'd rather forget, stored GeoJSON things in them. Um, I don't recommend you do that. It's horrible, but it is possible. Uh, whilst I don't want to... That's it. Right. Lastly, um, my friend Christina is giving a talk this afternoon about the Women in Geospatial group. Um, they're a wonderful group, and if you want to have a chat, go for it. Thank you, and questions? Cool. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, excellent. We're, we're getting a Ooh, clap good. there, a virtual clap through the, um, the reactions. Thanks, Tom. Um, yes, so if people have any questions, please add them into the chat. Otherwise, I've got a, a quick um, question for you, Emily, which is, um, could you just say a little bit more about what TIFFAX is written in and how you install it and run it? Ah, yes, certainly can. Uh, so it is written in a language called Go. Um, I am only fairly new as a Python programmer, so I generally write things in other languages when I have a chance. Um, <laughs> and I like Go because it's a very quick and it comes out as a single binary file. So you just have a little application you download, you put it in your path somewhere and it just kind of works. Um, the, yeah, it's available from GitHub. Um, I can oops, stick that in the chat, I think, cool. to everybody, if anyone wants a copy of it. Um, yeah, so yeah, installing it is literally copy, um, download the release, drop it in your path somewhere, and that's it. Brilliant. Um, I don't like things being complicated, it's annoying. <laughs> Uh, the, sorry, I saw there was another question from somebody there, but my list is gone. James, James Passmore, does it highlight potential issues? So yeah, if it has a trouble decoding something, you'll get a message come out here saying, Ugh, the IFD said it had zero entries in it, or, you know, whatever the error is. It will display the output up here as much as it has been able to decode so far. Um, but once it hits an error, it will stop and say, something's happened. I don't know quite what to do with this. Cool. Um, we've had another question from Jez Nicholson as well. So how frequently are TIFF files broken and is it because the index is corrupt? Uh, so I've seen it happen. Um, most of my experience with them when they're being broken is mostly due to my own errors in other code that I've written. So I've been trying to write something which reads a TIFF file or that kind of thing, and I'm getting complete twaddle out the other side of it. Um, I have seen it happen, and I, we have decoded, figured out what's going on with um, TIFF files from other sources occasionally when we've got images that just don't make sense. Um, we had an example, uh, one of the things we host is the CDAS platform, the Satellite Applications Catapult, which is a um, archive of Sentinel data over the UK, basically. And 
for some reason, some of the Sentinel-1 imagery we were getting was getting very mangled. Um, and we were able to work out what was going on from this tool and basically see that it was, instead of putting the strips side by side, they all got stacked on top of each other. Um, so what was supposed to be a very wide image was actually really thin and long. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so another question from Fakhar Khalid, um, and it relates to something that I was going to ask about cloud optimized geotiffs. But his question is, what is the future of TIFF in a web environment? Yep, and as you've just said, cloud optimized geotiffs. Um, the short version of cloud optimized geotiffs is they basically insert some structure to all of this. So everywhere I've said, you know, oh, this could be anywhere. Well, this is appointed to somewhere. Um, a cloud optimized GeoTiff says, this is the order you have to put this stuff in. And doing so makes things so much easier for everybody. Um, right. The obvious reason for doing it is that you can then go, oh, I just read the head of it. Right, now I know where everything else is. But yeah, just generally, if you can render it as a cog, please do so. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Um, cool. I think, unless there's any more questions going to come in, uh, I think we will leave it there. That's been really great. Thank you very much for that and for kicking us off in, in the Sentinel stream. Um,